Chapter 134, Seventh Year, Valentine's Day, 1978. Monday, the 13th of February, 1978. You know, Lily yawned, other boyfriends might take the night before Valentine's Day to plan something nice for their girlfriends, rather than plan an assault on other students. I thought we were calling it a practical joke, Evans, Sirius winked. Anyway, how do you know what other boys are doing? We're the only boys you know, and we're doing this. Hmm, touché. Lily poked her tongue out at him from where she sat cross-legged on James's bed. And, James said, sitting on the floor beside Remus, folding envelopes as fast as Remus could stuff them. How do you know I haven't already planned something nice? When do you have the time? She shrugged. Whenever you're not with me, you're playing Quidditch. I can multitask, he said haughtily, a mischievous twinkle in his eye. Remus gave James a sideways glance. He couldn't account for any of James's free time either, but it was best never to underestimate James Potter. How about you, Peter? Mary asked, sitting on James's other side, neatly stacking the envelopes he handed her and ticking names off the list. Big plans for tomorrow? No, Peter replied glumly. He was lying on his stomach on his bed, frantically completing the charms notes due for the next day. He dropped a few hints to Remus about copying them, but Remus had pretended not to understand, and eventually poor Wormtail had dropped it and just resigned himself to doing a poor job. What about Dorcas? Mary pressed. Dumped me. Aw, poor love, she cooed. At least I won't be the only single one. Really? Pete looked up, hopefully. Yeah, dump that stupid Hufflepuff. Mary nodded, bent over her work. Oh, well, if you fancy dinner, maybe. Peter started. Mary shook her head. Oh no, sorry, Peter. I'm triple booked as it is. It'll be a miracle if none of them bump into each other. Oh. Peter returned to his homework, looking even more depressed than before. Lily stifled a giggle, but Mary seemed oblivious. Cheer up, Pete. We still love you. Remus offered, stuffing his very last envelope and handing it to James. Me and Padfoot will have dinner with you. So, basically exactly the same as every other night of the year, Sirius teased. Are you two not doing anything then? Mary asked casually. It felt like a loaded question all the same, and Remus found it hard to ignore the glances his friends were now shooting at each other. He looked up at Sirius and said very firmly, Don't even think about it. Sirius's face cracked into a smile. I think Valentine's Day is Mooney's idea of hell. Exactly. Remus nodded solemnly. Let the girls have their flowers and hearts. He had plenty else going on, thank you very much. Oh, I think that's a shame, Mary said, crossing the last name of her list and stretching her legs out on the rug, lying back on her elbows. Valentine's Day can be nice, if you do it right. Remus smirked at her. Doing it right, to Mary, meant receiving many offerings from her various acolytes, a fantasy in which she was Aphrodite and all would play homage. Nope, not interested, he said, stretching his own stiff legs. Just a normal day. Sirius likes it, Mary said slyly. He was always dead romantic. When we weren't fighting, Sirius interjected. Remus looked at him and realised he had never actually considered whether or not the other boy was interested in celebrating the day. He just assumed they were on the same page. Anyway, that was different, Peter mused, sucking the nib of his quill and getting ink on his lip. What was? Mary asked. When when Padfoot was going out with you, Peter replied. Obviously he did all the mushy stuff then. Obviously? Lily spoke up. Remus cringed. He could see where this was going. The redhead had her hackles up. It didn't happen often, but when it did, it always ended in a scolding. What do you mean, Peter? Peter saw it coming too, but bless him, he tried to explain himself. I wasn't being nasty, he said. It's just, well, it's not the same thing, is it? Yes, it is, Mary frowned. James was clearly annoyed too. Remus sighed inwardly. 
He looked up at Sirius, who shrugged at him. Remus held out his hand, and Sirius hopped off the bed to take it, putting Remus to his feet. Remus cleared his throat. If you've all finished discussing our relationship among yourselves... They all looked up sheepishly. Sorry, Mooney. Sorry, Remus. Let's move on, shall we? Remus raised an eyebrow and leaned against his bedpost with his hands in his pockets. He nodded at the pile of sealed envelopes. We need to pass those around tomorrow, as soon as. I think probably best to do it at breakfast, so it gets mixed in with the regular post and doesn't look suspicious. This was met with a murmur of general agreement. Don't forget, the ink only becomes legible when the right person gives their name. Remus continued. He went over to his bedside table for his matchbox of cigarettes and slid one out. That was such a good idea. I can't believe you did it so quickly, Mary said. She didn't know that the spell they'd used was exactly the same one that they'd used on the Marauder's map, and they weren't going to tell her. You are in the presence of greatness, MacDonald, Sirius said, taking Remus's cigarette the second he'd lit it. Remus sighed and pulled out another. At least open a window if you're going to smoke in here, James sighed. We have to smoke in here, Sirius said, flicking his wand at the windows that they flung wide open. Because our poxy head boy banned smoking in the common room. All the prefects voted on that, actually, Lily said wryly. See, Mooney? Sirius nudged him with his hip. This, this is why you should have stayed a prefect. You could have been the voice of dissent. <sighs> Truly tragic, Remus exhaled smoke. Right, I'm off to bed then, Mary said, getting up, lifting the pile of invitations and setting them down on James's trunk. I'm looking forward to this. Be nice to have something else to think about. I'll come with you, Lily said, getting up too. Shall I walk you back? James leapt up to his feet. Both girls giggled as if he'd said something charming rather than ridiculous. I'll keep her safe on the arduous journey across the common room, Potter, Mary teased. Still, Lily and James spent the next five minutes bidding each other goodbye, which involved a lot of snogging. When Mary finally managed to drag her friend away, Lily was pink and grinning. Love you, she called on her way down the stairs. Love you too, James called back. Sirius began to make sick noises, which made Peter start laughing. But Remus just watched James's dopey expression. He hadn't heard them say I love you before. He didn't think he'd ever heard anyone say it, actually. Not anyone he cared about, at least. He'd seen it written down, in books, and in the letter from Hope. But neither of those things had felt as tangible as this. How long had they been saying that? As long as they'd been feeling it? Was it hard to say it the first time? Remus thought it must be, like casting a Patronus. He finished his cigarette in a contemplative mood, while the others moved around him, finishing homework and changing for bed. He supposed he could ask Sirius about the whole love thing, but he wasn't sure he wanted to open that can of worms. They were happy as they are, weren't they? It was just getting comfortable, now that their friends knew. Plus, after two years of pining and almost a year of secrecy, Remus wanted to just enjoy what they had, without all of that prescriptive stuff hanging over them. Remus knew from experience that it was best to resist the temptation to pick things like that apart, especially something as precious and hard-won as he and Sirius had. The problem was, once you started, you might never remember how it worked in the first place. He brushed his teeth still thinking, and wandered towards Sirius's bed to sit and wait for him. Finished! Peter cried, raising his quill with a flourish. Finally! Ugh! <sighs> Well done, Pete, James yawned, climbing into bed. I didn't get to help you lot, though, Peter said, looking at the pile of envelopes wistfully. That's okay. This is only preliminary work, Remus offered. The real planning starts on Wednesday. Exactly, James nodded encouragingly. Anyway, don't feel bad. Padfoot didn't help either. Oi! Sirius came out of the bathroom at that moment. I wrote the damn things. Where would you lot be without my beautiful penmanship? And I don't recall Mrs. Prongs doing anything either. He had taken to calling Lily this in private. He wouldn't dare to do so to her face. With the full knowledge that it annoyed James, 
The messy head boy just rolled over in his bed, flicking his middle finger in Cirrus's direction. Cirrus chuckled and got into his own bed. Remus got in too, still deep in thought. Night, lads, Sirius called, drawing the curtain shut. Night, Peter and James echoed back. In the dark, Sirius held Remus's hand, and they smiled at each other sleepily. You're very quiet, Sirius whispered. Everything okay? Yeah, Remus whispered back. Just thinking, prank stuff. Good. Sirius? Remus? You know Valentine's Day? I've heard of it. Did you... Did you wanna... What, what Mary said? I knew that that would get you wound up. I could practically see your brain start to overheat. Piss off. Remus kicked his shin. I'm just asking. Mary loved all of that stuff. Presents and flowers and cards and shit. And I liked doing it for her. Because it made her happy. You'd hate it, so I won't. It's just so public, Remus said. I know, don't worry about it. Okay. Remus. What? Stop worrying. Fine, fine, I believe you. Anyway, it's not even a real thing, Sirius said thoughtfully. Valentine's Day. I looked it up. It's real to muggles, isn't it? Remus frowned. He couldn't say he'd given it much thought. There was a bloke called Valentine, but there's nothing especially romantic about it. But I did find out some other stuff about the Romans. Why can't you apply this thirst for knowledge to your actual schoolwork? Ugh, don't be so boring. Anyway, have you heard of Lupercalia? Remus felt a sinking feeling in his stomach and let go of Sirius's hand. I don't want to talk about wolf stuff right now. You have heard of it? Sirius sounded pleased. No, I just know the Latin word for wolf because it's my bloody name. Oh, right. It's not what you think. It's a festival. Okay. And it's really cool. There are blood sacrifices and running around naked and... I'm going to sleep. But you like history. Shut up, Padfoot. He wants to go to sleep. James shouted from across the room. And so do I. Yeah, Peter echoed. Mind your own business, Sirius shouted back. Sonora Quesis, Remus muttered, creating a dry bubble of silence inside the bed. He still whispered when he spoke, though, because it was weird to talk at a normal volume in the dark. I said I didn't want to talk about wolf stuff. God. I was only trying to make you feel better about Valentine's Day. I didn't feel badly about it in the first place. Oh, okay. Sorry I misread you. Cyrus was whispering too, but loudly, obviously annoyed. You're all quiet about it and I wanted to cheer you up. I thought you were jealous of Lily and James. Jealous? That's the wrong word. You, you were just... I saw you watching them, kissing and stuff, and being all mushy. And I know you hate public displays of affection, but I don't know. It's, it's not like we have a choice either way. Remus blinked in the dark, rolling back over to see Cyrus's face. It bothers you, doesn't it? It had to, because it had never really bothered Remus before. Suddenly, he realised what it had all been about. A bit, maybe. Cyrus replied, honestly. Remus fumbled under the duvet for his hand again. Tuesday, the 14th of February, 1978. The next morning, James and Sirius were nowhere to be found. Remus presumed that they had left early for Quidditch practice. It was a bright, sunny day, despite a chill in the air. After a few minutes of deep thought, Remus rifled through his bedside drawer for his very last chocolate frog and bunged it in his pocket before heading downstairs. The rest of the Gryffindors awoke to find that in the night the house elves had decorated their common room with garlands of red and pink paper hearts, something which seemed to divide all of the students. It's hardly appropriate in school, Christopher grumbled, meeting Remus and Mary on their way out of the portrait hall. Ah, I think it's lovely, Mary sighed cheerily. She was subtly dressed for the occasion, wearing a red ribbon in her hair, 
and red enamel studs in each earlobe. Christopher shook his head grimly at her. If it were a proper holiday, like Christmas or Easter or something. But why do wizards celebrate those things? Remus cut in thoughtfully as they progressed towards the dining hall. Every corridor was also decked out in pink and red crepe paper, and there seemed to be music coming from somewhere. None of the purebloods I've met are Christian, or even know anything about Jesus, or the Easter bunny, or... The Easter what? Christopher was staring at him as if he was mad. Ah, don't bother, Remus. Mary laughed. Lily and I tried back in first year. We're not supposed to ask. Christopher's mood did not improve as they entered the Great Hall, which was bathed in a rosy pink glow by a collection of candles floating inside red glass lanterns. Fresh flowers had been placed in vases on every table, and pink envelopes flew back and forth over heads of the students. Valentine cards, looking for their recipient. For goodness sake, Christopher muttered, taking his seat and pouring himself a very black coffee. It's only one day, Remus said, lifting the teapot, which was also pink. As soon as they sat down, a pile of pink envelopes fluttered into Mary's lap, making her squeal with delight. Remus grinned too. He pulled out his own envelopes and whispered an incantation, tossing them into the air so that they might mingle with the others flying above them. Here you go, Chris. Remus tossed one across the table. It's not a valentine, I promise. Oh, uh, what is it? Christopher held the blank envelope warily. An invitation? Remus winked. Give it your name, but don't share it, okay? Uh, okay. Good morning. Lily appeared, looking cheerful as usual, clutching a book on advanced potions. Anyone seen Potter? Quidditch pitch? Remus raised his head. Nope, Lily shrugged. I thought so too, but Ravenclaw booked it this morning. He and Padfoot were gone when I woke up, Remus said. That's exactly what I was afraid of, Lily replied, taking her seat. As soon as she had sugared her porridge, a loud pop echoed over their heads and everyone looked up. Those students who hadn't immediately died for cover beneath their breakfast tables began ooing and ahhing, as a rather spectacular firework display began over their heads. The burst of colour took the form of a gigantic glittering love heart, and the embers which raised down turned out to be pink and white flower heads. Lilies, Mary said gleefully, as one settled on her pile of cards. Oh no, Christopher wailed. I'm allergic. Choo! He sneezed, before aiming his wand upwards and gasping, Protego, to defend himself against the fluttering blooms. I don't believe this. Lily was blushing harder than Remus had ever seen her. He grinned. You're asking for it, I'm afraid. I'd have been happy with a card, she hissed, as the final fireworks died out, and the last of the lilies sailed onto the floor like great pink snowflakes, filling the room with their lovely scent. Oh, shut up, Evans, Mary tutted. It's bloody gorgeous of him. Cheers, MacDonald. James appeared at Lily's shoulder with Sirius. You utter idiot. Lily stood up and wound her arms around James's neck, kissing him. Remus wasn't watching this display, though. He was watching Sirius, who flicked his wand behind James's back. The flowers which had gathered on the table, those which Chris had not tried to clear anyway, began to move again, and gathered together in front of Lily's plate. With another soft little pop, the pile had transformed into a large box, emblazoned with even more lilies. What's that? Lily turned, leaning over to get a closer look. Open it and see! James was grinning ear to ear, clearly utterly chuffed with himself. Christopher sneezed again and blew his nose, but was roundly ignored as Mary and Remus stood up to get a better look. Lily, still pink and smiling, carefully lifted the lid of the box, and everyone leaned in. On a red velvet pillow, with a bow around its neck, was a tiny little charcoal grey kitten, with huge yellow eyes. <gasps> Lily gasped, reaching in immediately to pick up the mewling creature and cuddle it closer. Really, Potter? You got me a cat! I love him! Or her! Him! James nodded. I know your old family one died last Christmas, and Hagrid told me a litter was born in the village last week, so... Ah, oh, 
he's so sweet. Mary reached over to stroke the kitten's head. Oh, for Merlin's sake. Christopher stood up, clutching his handkerchief to his nose. I'm allergic to cats, too. Bloody stupid day. With that, he got up and stormed away, further up the table. Such a shame, Sirius smirked, taking his empty seat. Morning, Mooney. Morning, Padfoot. Rimmer smiled. The rest of the breakfast was spent cooing over Lily's new kitten and trying to choose a name. Rumours kept a polite distance, just in case. He'd had bad experiences with cats in the past and didn't fancy any new scratches today, no matter how tiny its claws were. Soon, everyone was getting up to go to their various lessons while arguing over who ought to look after the kitten that morning. And Sirius fell into step with Remus. Walk you to history, he offered. Oh, I don't need to go, Remus replied slyly. It's a drop-in lesson, for newts. But you always go to your lessons, Sirius replied. Even the optional ones. I know, but you're always telling me to relax, so... Remus covertly pulled out his little matchbox out of his robe pocket and tapped it. Sirius raised an eyebrow. As much as I really love Stoned Mooney, what's brought on the rebellion? Does there have to be a reason? Remus shrugged. He glanced around quickly to check that no one was listening too intently, but they were all pretty absorbed in their various cards and gifts. He slipped the chocolate frog into Sirius's pocket. Happy Valentine's Day, wanker. He had never seen Sirius Black blush like that. Chapter 135, Seventh Year The Marauders Interhouse Prank Planning Cooperative Wednesday, the 15th of February, 1978 I can't believe you're holding this thing here, Christopher said agitatedly as Remus unlocked the charms classroom. Best way to avoid detection. Flitwick always lets me use it, Remus explained. Exactly, it's so brazen. Christopher chided as they entered. Brazen is our middle name, James declared excitedly, following them. Your middle name is Fleeman, you prat, Sirius scoffed. And this place is genius. No one will ever suspect anything. I knew your SWAT lessons would come in useful one day, Mooney. A lot of people find Remus's study groups very helpful, actually, Christopher said primly, folding his arms and leaning against the wall. <laughs> Chris, he's just teasing. Remus chuckled, setting his book bag down. He glanced at his pocket watch. We're all nice and early. James, have you got an agenda? A what? James turned around from the blackboard, where he was directing the chalk to draw a gigantic lion with Gryffindor rules, okay, beneath it. <sighs> Never mind, Remus said. So, who else got an invitation? Christopher asked, over the top of his book, which seemed to have materialised out of nowhere. Christopher was the only other person Remus knew who could go from zero to reading in less than three seconds flat. About twenty or thirty people, maybe? Remus said. Anyone who expressed an interest before Christmas, who seemed trustworthy. It was an extremely rigorous vetting process, actually, James said, now standing on Flitwick's desk and trying to touch the ceiling with his fingertips. <laughs> yeah, we almost didn't let Wormtail in. Sirius barked with laughter from the window, where he was leaning half out of it, smoking. Remus dearly wanted to go over there and wrap his arms around Sirius, steal the cigarette, which was probably one of his anyway, the thief, and kiss his neck. But the others would be arriving soon, and it was a completely mental line of thinking that. Why do you all call Peter that? Christopher asked. Just a nickname they all said in unison. Peter arrived shortly after that, followed in by Mary, Lily and Yasmin. There were the sixth and seventh years from Remus's study group, and Dorcas, who was still on friendly terms with Peter apparently. Mary's latest squeeze, a Ravenclaw boy called John T. Simmons, who looked like he couldn't believe his luck. And finally, much to Remus's distaste, Emmeline Vance sorted in, two minutes late, with Roman Rotherhide. The room was pretty crowded after that, and noisy with the buzz of excitement. Most of the group had some idea why they were there, but others were curious, and all of them were fascinated by the marauders. Sirius and James adored the attention, of course, and immediately took centre stage. Now, 
We all know why we're here, James started, using his Quidditch captain voice. Immediately, Emmeline Vance's arm shot up. Sorry, but I don't... Remus gave an impatient snort, and Christopher, sitting next to him, shot him a strange look. Nor do I. Dorcas raised her hand too, along with one or two six-years from Remus's study group. Why did all of you come, then? Sirius asked, eyebrows raised. A group of girls sitting at the back of the room giggled. Remus made a mental note. He tried to avoid inviting too many members of the Sirius Black fan club, but it was pretty unavoidable when that applied to half the school. We're here to plan a, an organised protest, Christopher said, blushing a bit, because he wasn't used to speaking in front of lots of people. Against Slytherin. Yeah, another six-year shouted. I heard you lot were planning your biggest prank yet. I heard one of you knows how to get the monster out of the Chamber of Secrets. I heard you were planning to blow up the dungeons, one Hufflepuff boy squeaked. Whoa, whoa, whoa. James held up his hands. Bit less dramatic than that. Well, if it's about getting the Slytherins back for all the nonsense they've pulled, then I'm in, Emmeline said decisively, tossing her luxuriant blonde curls. Rumours tutted loudly, and Chris shot him another look. That's exactly what it's about, and exactly why we need all of you to keep quiet about this, James said, getting into his flow now. This is our last year, and we're inviting all of you to help us plan our final prank. Does that make us marauders? The Hufflepuff boy squeaked again. There was an excited murmur. No, Peter said indignantly, though no one really paid attention to him. I like to think of it as more of a collaboration, James said thoughtfully. An inter-house cooperative, Cyrus added. Everyone seemed pretty pleased with that. At least it sounded impressive and official enough. Right. James clapped his hands together and rubbed them, smiling around at everyone. Now that that's out of the way, who's got some ideas? Twenty hands shot up. <clears throat> uh, Lily spoke up. I think before we get into it, it, it might be good to have some ground rules. Like what? Sirius folded his arms grumpily. Like, not actually hurting anyone. This is just fun, okay? Not revenge for anything Slytherin's ever done. She was using her head girl voice now, and a few people lowered their hands. Fair enough, James said, holding up his hands amicably, coming between Sirius and Lily. No physical harm intended. And as I said before, no talking about it outside of this room. On the pain of death. Joking, Evans. He ducked as she went to slap the back of his head. After these initial teething problems, everyone seemed to enter into the spirit of the thing. Lots of people had ideas. From the extreme, Lily squashed an idea of summoning a banshee to haunt the dungeons. To the subtle, Emmeline knew of a spell which could transfigure everyone's right shoe into a left shoe. She said she'd done it to her sister over the summer, and it had taken her three days to realise what had been bothering her. Eventually, time ran short, so James sat everyone homework, requiring them to come back next week with an idea. Then we can decide on the best one, Sirius declared. Who decides? Mary narrowed her eyes. Me, James, Pete and Mooney, obviously. Sirius raised his chin. Can't we vote? One of the six years asked. Yeah, that seems fairer, Mary nodded. If we're all putting ourselves at risk of expulsion for you... Expulsion? Christopher bit his lip. Sh surely not. Surely we won't go that far. Will we get in trouble, though? The Hufflepuff boy raised his hand again. Everyone looked at him. Not much, Syria shrugged. Bit of detention never hurt anyone. No, sorry, I didn't mean detention. The boy shook his head nervously. I, I mean with, you know, the Slytherins. They won't tell the Death Eaters to get us, will they? Sirius looked about to laugh. Then he realised that the atmosphere in the room had changed. A few people looked very awkward. Some of them were whispering amongst themselves. Remus could even smell a whiff of real fear creeping into the room. 
Everybody seemed to have tensed up a bit. Of course, Sirius and James didn't worry about that sort of thing. This was all part of the crusade of chaos they'd been on since they were eleven. Even Remus had been pretty flippant about the magnitude of the prank. But he saw now that it meant a lot to those who gathered in the room. James, Sirius and Peter were the only purebloods in attendance, unless you counted Christopher, who had his own axe to grind with the Slytherins. James stood up, pushing off Flitwick's desk and drawing himself to full height. Absolutely not. No one in this room is getting hurt because of this prank. A few people relaxed. After all, James Potter, heir to the sleek easy fortune, head boy, Quidditch captain and leading mischief maker, was somebody that most people trusted. Remus believed him wholeheartedly, even if the issue had not been raised. It would have been a point of honour for James to protect anyone smaller than him. Lily was beaming at him too, and Sirius looked very pleased, as if that had settled everything. Right. Lily clapped her hands together now, taking the floor again. See you all again next week, I suppose. I think we'd better all leave in small groups. We don't want to draw attention to ourselves. With that, the room slowly turned to normal, groups of students now chattering excitedly about the ideas they had or curses they'd like to try out. Lily assumed her head girl voice and started directing people out of the room in groups of three or four at short intervals. The marauders turned inwards to confer. Bloody hell, James muttered, so that he wouldn't be overheard. That was intense. What did you expect? Mary tutted, hoisting herself up onto a desk and swinging her legs. This isn't a game to everyone. Some people are out for revenge. Then that's what we'll give them, Sirius said fiercely. He had that brightness in his eyes that told Remus he would be utterly unbearable for the next few hours. A plan was afoot, and nothing could bring Sirius down from that kind of excitement. Calm down, Black, Mary teased. You're school kids, not generals. For now, he replied darkly. Okay, you lot. Lily turned back into the room. It was only seven of them left. We'll go back in two groups, because no one is going to believe you four won't up to something. Mary, James, Lily and Peter left first, with instructions for Remus, Sirius and Christopher to give them a ten minute head start. Remus was a bit reluctant about this, but there was no way to bring it up. He couldn't help remembering what had happened the last time he and Christopher were alone in that classroom with Sirius. Though, of course, Christopher hadn't known Sirius was there at the time, and nor would Remus ever tell him. They tidied up the desks, cleared the chalkboard of James's lion, and then stood about awkwardly for a little bit. Let's play truth or dare, Sirius grinned. Why? Remus sighed, leaning on the desk. Here we go. To pass the time. We could just have a, a normal conversation. Christopher wants to, don't you, Christopher? Uh, great, you can go first. Truth or dare, what do you fancy? Um, Chris's eyes flicked between Remus and Sirius nervously. I, I don't, um, truth? Excellent. Start off easy, if it's your first time playing. Sirius nodded encouragingly. Hmm, let me see. Ah, okay. Why did you want to get involved with the prank? What? You know, how come you came today? Chris has been involved since the beginning, Padfoot. You know that. Remus tutted. Right, right. So what made you get involved in the first place, then? If you have to know, Christopher said, rather icily. It was your brother. Sirius, to his credit, did not flinch. Fair enough. He's a right little prick, he nodded. He licked his lips and glanced at Remus, then back at Chris. Sure there's no other reason? No. I'll go next, Remus said quickly. Chris, you can you can ask me to do a dare. He never picked truth. It was far too dangerous. Um, Christopher bit his lip, still a bit thrown off by the whole thing. Oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm crap at this sort of thing. I've got a good one, Sirius said at once. He winked at Remus, then leaned over and whispered in Chris's ear. Christopher's eyes widened and he laughed, covering his mouth. Okay, Remus. Chris was still blushing, 
but he was having fun now. Okay, you, you, you have to write something rude on the blackboard and leave it there. I gave you specifics, Sirius complained. I'm not saying that out loud, Christopher laughed, turning even redder. Remus could easily guess the tone of Sirius's suggestion. He raised an eyebrow wryly, as if under duress. Okay, fine, I'll do it. He went up to the board and picked up some chalk. He considered for a moment. How rude, he asked the other two casually. Very, Christopher said, smirking shyly. Well, it's the rules of the game, I suppose. Remus began to draw, enjoying the snickering over his shoulder as he deftly traced out the first rude thing that popped into his head. He stepped back, an artist admiring his work. The other two boys stood either side of him, grinning madly. Well? he asked. Syria slapped him on the back. Mooney, me old pal. It's the biggest knob I've ever seen. <laughs> That's a relief, Remus smirked, forgetting Christopher was there. He didn't seem to notice, or else just assume that it was marauder humour, which it sort of was. It's glorious, the younger boy nodded, still very pink about the cheeks. Come on then, Remus set down the chalk. That's enough of a gap. We can go now. Common room. Oi! I've not yet had my turn! Christopher folded his arms. What's the point? Remus shook his head. You always choose a dare, and there's nothing I can think of that you wouldn't even think twice about doing. Are you saying I'm the bravest? Stupidest, maybe. Remus teased, elbowing him in the ribs. Come on, let's go. They left the classroom and set off through the quiet hallways back to Gryffindor Tower. It was fairly late in the evening now, and curfew was only a couple of hours off, so they were mostly alone, other than the portraits, who were enjoying the peace and quiet. Did you finish Maurice, Remus? Chris asked, always back to books. Nearly, Remus replied. Just a chapter or two to go. Do you promise me it's a happy ending? Definitely. Chris nodded. You'll love it. I was thinking, if if you're free on Saturday, we, we, we could have a, a chat about it in the Three Broomsticks. I'd really like to know what you think. Yeah, maybe. Remus was torn between his desire not to disappoint Christopher, which he always seemed to be doing, and his keen awareness of Sirius's very mercurial mood. Don't see why not. Is that the muggle book you've been reading? Sirius asked. Is it good, then? Yeah, it's, it's quite good. Remus nodded cautiously. Great. Maybe I'll have to give it a read. I can get it done by Saturday. I read faster than you. You do not, Remus scowled, scandalised. Well, I have more time to read anyway. Only because you hardly go to your lessons, Remus shot back. I doubt it's your sort of thing, Sirius. Christopher spoke up. They both looked at him. He shrugged. Well, it's not. Tell him what it's about, Remus. Uh. But it was too late. Sirius was already rummaging in the book bag at Remus's hip as they walked, and at once withdrew the text. Remus fought the urge to snatch it back, only because he'd underlined some parts of it, just because he liked them so much, and he was embarrassed to think about it now. I think you're beautiful. The only beautiful person I've ever seen. I love your voice and everything to do with you, down to your clothes or the room you're sitting in. I adore you. Fortunately, Sirius didn't flip through the pages, only looked at the back cover, frowning slightly. Isn't this one of my uncle's? he asked. Yeah, you, you said I could borrow it. Remus rubbed the back of his head. Is it dirty? No. Oh. Well, I'll read it anyway. Sirius poked out his tongue. That can be my dare. Very brave. Rumours grabbed the book back and shoved it into his bag. But it's about... Christopher frowned. They were almost at the portrait hole now, and Sirius stopped, making all three of them stop too. Sirius looked at Remus, raising an eyebrow. He nodded to Chris. He makes a lot of assumptions, this one. Remus was surprised to find that his own cheeks were heating up too. He shrugged. 
He doesn't know you very well. Oi, Christopher. Sarah shot him a very wicked look. Dare me to snog Mooney. Wh- wh- what? I... Christopher looked stricken, as if he knew there was a joke somewhere, but he couldn't figure out the punchline. Sirius wasted no time. He took Remus's head roughly and pulled him in for a kiss. Remus gave in. He was a bit mean, but he could hardly refuse. If it was a test of loyalty, or simply something Sirius thought would be funny, he had to go along with it. Oh, for Merlin's sake! A voice came from further up the corridor, causing Sirius and Remus to spring apart. I'm away for a week and the castle turns into an orgy. All three boys spun around to see Marlene standing there in her travelling cloak, duffel bag at her side. She gave them a knowing wink. What a load of queers. End of chapter 135